what makes a successful language learner. In the following videos, six highly proficient language learners discuss what characteristics made them successful at language learning. Yeah, I took Spanish when I was in high school for two years, and I, I didn't really learn much. Um, I just, I, I, I think that the way that they teach Spanish or, or foreign languages in high school in general is just a really flawed method. Um, and so, yeah, I can't really think of anybody that I've heard, that I've met who has said that they actually learned the language that they were going for in high school, unless they took it for four years and went on multiple trips to the place that they were, uh, that their language came from. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't know, I don't, I wouldn't say that there's a language gene out there, but perhaps some people do have an aptitude for language learning easier than others. Um, just like some people have the gift for learning music uh, over other people, or some people are mechanically minded, or you know, um, really good at grammar, English, that kind of thing, science. Uh, I do believe that we all have kind of different skill sets and and aptitudes, and so in that sense, maybe maybe I did have a gift or an extra ability or something like that to pick it up, um, but at the same time. I don't know, because I honestly, it just came down to that I, I wanted to learn it. I loved learning it. I loved learning French, and I spent so much time on it. Um, and so it's hard to say if I really just had an incredible ability or if I just wanted to learn it more than everyone else. You know what I'm saying? Well, one thing is that our team collectively decided that since we were going to be here long term, we were going to set aside the first two years of our time in the Philippines dedicated to language learning. And Tim, my husband, uh, particularly made a, an agreement with the Lord that he would not preach in the Philippines until he could preach in Ilocano. So he wouldn't accept English preaching opportunities, of which he was given many. And so several of us followed suit, not that I was asked a lot to preach, but when I became good in Ilocano, then I was asked to preach even at at conferences and such. And so um, how did we get past the busyness of it? Well, for one thing, in my case, um, I knew that learning the language was going to take a long time. One of the best things I did was move into a village. That was um, after, um, after living in a place that was along the highway when we, when we didn't have any neighbors right next to us and we had to walk a kilometer to get to the next village, I said to Tim, I can't live this way. I didn't move 8,000 miles from home to live a kilometer away from the people I'm trying to reach. Let's move into a village. So we did some survey. We moved into a village, but there was no houses for rent. So there was a place where, well, we can move out of our upstairs if you want to rent the upstairs. So we did. We just had one baby. And we rented it upstairs and downstairs. We shared it with them. They weren't Christians, but they were they took care of us they we were their americans and nobody was going to you know sell them a, a bill of goods uh, you know not on their watch you know and so they were kind to us and and then i'd listen to the mom and i'd listen to what she'd say to her 10 year old daughter and i'd look at the daughter's expression and i'd see what she would do ah oh, that's how you say that and so i was surrounded by ilocano all around us they, you know his grandma and grandpa there and another son and such and so living plunked down right in the middle of it was great. And, you know, sometimes it was hard, you know, trying to figure out what they meant and what they were thinking. But, you know, it's hard to live with anyone. It's hard to live with fellow Americans. If you live with people that are of a different culture, when you come to a hard spot, you say, well, it's probably because I don't understand the language. It's probably because I don't understand the culture. And you just say, oh, well. But if you're living with Americans, you'd be like, why did she say that? She knows right well that blah, blah, blah. So if you're living with the 
other people in the culture, if you're living with the people in the culture, then when you see your American friends after a week or two, oh, it's so nice to talk, and you gab, you know? And you're so happy to see them instead of like, you know? <laughs> well, I think I, <laughs> I, did, I did home meetings on Friday nights. We had our Sunday services, Sunday school in the morning on Sunday and the evening service. And then we also did a Friday night service, and it usually was in the home of one of the members. And I remember one night, I was <clears throat> just starting at this, and I did my little Bible study. It was all, you know, had it all charted out. But then I had, came to the end, and I asked if people had uh, prayer requests. Well, each one gave a prayer request. I didn't understand a word they said. They blah, 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 blah. And so there were four or five prayer requests that were given. <clears throat> and so when it came time to pray, I said, well, we've had uh, these prayer requests. No, this brother here is going to lead us in prayer. <laughs> so that way uh, they were able to have their prayer requests. Someone else prayed for them, but uh, I couldn't have done it myself. And there were lots of other things that you do, you know, just life itself as a teacher and if you're dealing with people all the time, and I was, then uh, it's immersion into the culture that really is the most important thing. I had to make time for it, um, even if it was just 30 minutes or an hour. But I also got, I got myself out of the compartmentalized mindset that says, this is my ministry time and this is my language learning time. And I began to think, everything is learning language. Because whether I was at my school teaching my students, or at church leading worship, or just talking a, over a cup of coffee, or out on the street, everything was a chance to learn language. Um, and that's why it's important to carry a journal with you uh, where you can just write down, write down things that, that you are learning or you don't know. You come, ac you come across something on the road and you say, I don't know this, then you go to someone and ask them what it is, or Google Translate, or something like that. Um, that that became my life for the the last quarter of internship, or maybe even the last half, where I greatly reduced my time in the books and looking up videos and listening and reading and stuff. And I just spent a whole lot of time talking with people and just using using all my time in and out of different places to count that as ministry, I mean, as language learning. Well, for us, everything everything gravitated around the language. I mean, there, there, was, no, there was no busy without French. Right. Um, there was no English to teach. There was, everything was French. And mm -hmm. so uh, if we didn't learn French, there was no sense, you know, we weren't going to be busy. So, and... And we were, at the time, we were with Youth of the Mission, and we do uh, traveling evangelism teams. And most of those teams, like I said earlier, were French, so we were inundated with French from early. Mm -hmm. So, um, learning French and learning ministry all happened sort of simultaneously. Right. Um, I think that the motivation is the key. Motivation is the bottom line. Uh, how you motivate yourself, uh, Everyone gets motivation differently, but um, if you're not motivated, you won't learn. Unless you're a prodigy of some type, uh, you're not going to learn the language unless you have a motivation. And uh, my motivation was to preach and, and to talk. And Sandra's motivation was to understand. So together we were dynamic. <laughs> but without her, I didn't understand anybody. And without me, she couldn't talk. Well, for the first seven months, we had no ministry responsibilities. And so uh, we were able to give basically at least 30 hours a week to intentional language study. Uh, that was the thing we were supposed to be busy with. And, and, you know, our teammates who had been there before wanted us to have that opportunity because they didn't because they had so many more things to do in terms of setup and preparation and things. So... We were able to do that for those first seven months. But after seven months, it was expected that any Bible studies or other kind of ministry things, and especially Bible studies, that our fellow missionaries were no longer going to come and do those. We were going to do those. 
And so my, the, direct, the direction of my language study shifted from just learning to speak common language to a very spiritual oriented vocabulary because I had to write sermons. And so that's when I began to doing a lot more writing, looking up stuff in the Bible, making sure I had the right words, trying to say it in a way that was right. And so there was, in many ways, a lack of time for me to simply go out and expand my vocabulary beyond what the spiritual terminology was that I had to use. So I, you know, for me, I felt like it kind of hindered me for the next probably year or so, but I was able to, you know, learn some of those sorts of words, and then by having more connection and relationship with people, I was able to talk to them about other things, and so as long as I was intentional about it, I could pick up more words, and, and, and really, once you get enough of the grammar to be able to, to make sentences, then it's up to you to kind of put yourself in scenarios where you will have to learn new words. Uh, otherwise, you'll just kind of plateau. So it, it, was, it was required that we visit, and then that's where we were able to continue to make progress. But I felt like I was slowed down a bit by the need to write sermons. It took a lot of time.